Father, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to once again study your word. In this case, this book of 2 Kings. And Father, we're going through a lot of kings this evening, and we're seeing a lot of brokenness of humanity. I suppose we should not be surprised. Humanity is pretty broken. We look at things that happened in Buffalo and in California at the church, and we realize what a wounded and terrible world this can be. And we understand why Jeremiah wrote, the heart is desperately wicked, who can know it? But in the midst of all this mess, there is a hope, and that hope finds its culmination in the gospel, in that you loved us so much you sent to your son. And we see, even as we go through these Old Testament passages, the preservation of the line that would bring us Messiah. And so, Father, guide us, go with us as we seek to grow to be all that you've called us to be. Help us to be more than an academic exercise, but something that stretches us to be hungry more for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's look at the quiz this evening. And this is quiz number seven for those of you who are paying attention. And for those who are watching online, the way you access the quiz is you go to the Shelter Rock Church webpage, click on events, then click on groups, then type in the name Kings and then become a member of that group and it gives you access to the page in which there is the quizzes if you like to be punished also with these luscious little quizzes here all right here's an easy one easy easy peasy who likes eye makeup athalia jezebel jehu the shumanite woman and the answer is jezebel Yes, and you know, I made the comment, that's probably why we uh, feel that a woman who has too much makeup on, she's at looking like a Jezebel. We, she might have put it on tastefully, for all we know. All we know is that she did put on eye makeup, and that was, uh, you know, ultimately has become down to us as perhaps over the top. Athalia may be related to Jezebel, Omri, Joram, Ahab. Now, this is a hard question, I would say. I know some of you will get probably at least one of these right, but the answer is all of them. Um, and because that is where she came from into uh, the household. And so she probably is related to all those uh, people, either by marriage or by blood. Number three. Jehoshaphat is a very special person because she killed Athaliah, started a Jewish sect, rescued Joash, stood up against King Jehoram. And if you remember this woman, I said this is a woman that's probably not given as much conversation as perhaps should be, you know, because she plays a pivotal role in the preservation of the Messianic line. Um, she, re she rescued Joash and took him away. And the thing is, she's the sister of Athalia. So I guess they're not talking, you know, in that family. But she saw, you know, what should be. And uh, Athalia saw her own only self, you know, in terms of what was going on. It is fascinating how one family can have people that are so divergent. Um, there was a, a movie I watched because Roy Diefendorf, a, a Syosset attender, he actually bought the whole theater for as many people in the church to go to this movie as possible. And it was called The Something Gift. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Ultimate. The Ultimate Gift. Thank you. Very good. So the movie is called The Ultimate Gift. And there's a line in the movie that I, that I thought was very funny. It's amazing how far an apple can fall from the tree and still roll a great distance, nevertheless, you know, so like really far from the tree. And that seems the difference between Athalia and Jehoshaba. Next, Jehodiah seems to be, to be a very good high priest because he hides Joash, he mentors Joash, he removes evil Athalia. Things go bad after he dies. 
And the answer is, this one you can almost figure out logically, but it's all of them. He does all of those things. He's a very active high priest. I mean, he's almost functioning like a king, but he is a benevolent leader, and he seems to have the kingdom's best interest at heart. And we see some beautiful qualities of him. I would say that was a highlight last week when we studied. You could do a nice sermon study on this guy. And, you know, he's not perfect. When they were refurbishing the temple, the priests that worked for him were like kind of sitting on the money. They weren't stealing it. They just weren't doing anything with it. But, um, but generally speaking, he is a pretty good guy. Um, it, it's funny. Things will go bad after he dies. That is not to elevate him. There are CEOs. And this has been studied. They actually want their company to fail after they retire. So everyone would go, oh, those were the great days when Lee Iacocca was head of, you know, Chrysler. But that is not an ideal. The best leaders want their organization to thrive after they're gone. And sometimes that's not easy for our egos and our pride. Um, but it's the wisest thing to do. And uh, in his case, I'm not saying, you know, in terms of high priest, the Lord chooses the high priest. But um, he was a decent one. Number five. When Joash became king, he was given a scepter, a crown, a copy of the covenant, a pillar. Now, he was crowned king by a pillar. We talked about that. But what he was specifically given was a copy of the covenant. He may have received a scepter and a crown. The text doesn't tell us about it. But it does say he received a copy of the Bible. And when you look back, you know, let's say gifts that your mom and dad gave you at some point. Um, out of curiosity, how many of you received from a parent a copy of a Bible? Anyone here? Okay, a bunch of you. It's good. I know I did. You know, the first Bible I received was a little King James New Testament. I think I still have it. I mean, it is, uh, has some cool pictures in it, and I, I remember that. And then when I got a little older, my parents gave me a full Bible, King James. Again, King James is all we had, you know, but it had pictures in it still. And, uh, you know, those were cherished, uh, you know, gifts, and I still have both of them. I don't use them, <laughs> but, I, but I have them. Um, and... You know, this is probably the most important gift that Joash received. And I mentioned last week that Deuteronomy 17 specifically says to Moses, when the day comes, when the people ask for a king, here is what the king needs to do. And on the list is don't have too many wives, don't marry foreign women, don't gather to yourself too many horses, don't get, gather to yourself too much silver or gold, and you are to get a copy of the law from the Levites, write down a copy yourself, and carry it with you every day. That's pretty significant. And I think that's one of the best arguments for having an opportunity for you and I to have a quiet time. If it's good enough for the king, it's good enough for us. And, you know, I mentioned last week about Magna Carta because it said that the king is not authority unto himself, that he has to be responsible to the lords of the land. Well, this is, you know, way ahead of its time in that the kings of Israel were supposed to be under the authority of the word of God. They are not above it. They are under it. And that is so crucial. If you ever go to an old New England church, where do you usually see the pulpit? Is it in the center or is it towards the side? It's usually to the side. And is it like a flat platform? No, you go up the stairs to get to the, the podium. There's a theology behind that. It's a respectable theology. Is that when the pastor or priest is up there, he speaks for God. When he comes down, he is under the word of God like everybody else. If you ever want to go into ministry, and being that Moses went into ministry at age 80, 
you know, nobody's really exempt here, Frank, you know, uh, <laughs> but what you can experience is you're very conscious of the words you preach being still real at home. It's very significant. You know, I remember I went to preach a sermon and it was on, I don't know, compassion or helping the poor, something like that. And then after church, we went out to eat, which is my habit. We always go out to eat. It's kind of like my reward for preaching three times. We are going out to eat. Um, so I went to someplace in Westbury, Chili's or something, whatever. On the way back, there is a man walking with a fuel can up the ramp of exit 27, which is Shelter Rock Road from Northern State. Now, I know where the closest gas station is. It is about two and a half miles away when you get to Northern Boulevard. And I'm thinking, and I saw the guy's car. It was a, a kind of a broken down old car. And I'm thinking, I just preached on helping the poor. And so I passed the guy and I, I just pass him. I notice him, pass him. But by the time I got home, the spirit had convicted me. And I said, I need to go back and take care of that guy who's walking with the, the can. Because he's also got to go back. So I left my family there. I turned around. And quite honestly, there was another part I didn't want to pick him up. I don't know if the guy is dangerous and my whole family is in the car. Um, so I, I drove back down, made the turn in you know, northern, uh, excuse me, northern State, came back up, picked him up. Of course, he was very, very grateful. Took him to the gas station, waited for him to fill the thing, and then I took him back to his car. And uh, that is you know, a moment you're thinking of, is my life living up to what I say? I think this passage is so beautiful that here is your Book of the Covenant. Enjoy this gift. Live under it. You're the king. You're still responsible. Next one. Number six. Did you pay for the You know what? I, as I'm telling the story, I was wondering if I did. I don't think I did. I think, I, you know, he had the resources to do it, and I am helping him out. It wouldn't have. I mean, back then, gas was like two fifty a gallon. You know, right now, you're, you're putting a second mortgage on your house to fill your car with gas. You know, it's very, very expensive. Good question, though, Bill. <laughs> During the time of Joash, a high place is probably a mountain, a place to worship pagan gods, your backyard church, a place to worship blessed of God. Now, this one I could say is a little murky because I'm having a little fun with it. But what I'm wanting to say is your backyard church. In other words, people are not worshiping at these high places, Baal or Asherah or Molech. They have in the past of Israel done that, not at this time. So Joash is a good king because he doesn't allow pagan worship. He's not a super king because he doesn't get rid of the high places. It would be like a pastor saying, it's fine to just, you and your Bible in your house, you have your time with God. And for those of you who feel like coming, come on in the church. That just wouldn't be an ideal. God's ideal is people worship in a community together. And so, you know, how do we do that? How do we make that happen? You know, I think there will be theological discussion for years to come on how churches handle the pandemic, for example. You know, I think, you know, in the beginning in particular, Scripture admonishes us to honor the, those in authority over us. And so I think when, you know, everything was closed, it's reasonable to honor those in authority over you for a season. And even a very, very uh, fundamental church like John MacArthur closed the church for a season. But then he reached a point where he felt the government was overzealous in acting on its authority, particularly as we were learning more about the disease and, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I was fascinated in my own journey how churches that didn't have access to the internet handled this, such as churches in Africa. 
There are some huge churches in Nigeria, in Kenya, and I read a few journal articles which fascinated me. So if you have a church of, you know, a thousand people and you're in Kenya and uh, you don't have internet, what do you do? You know what? The law was there. It's the same as here. You can meet, even in the beginning of the pandemic, with under 10 people or 10 people or less. So what they decided to do was have 24-7 church, seven days a week, 10 people at a time each hour. Now you figure the arithmetic, that's covering their church. So your slot may be 3 a.m., but the people went to church. It was 10 of them, but they honored the law and went to church. I find their zeal to come to church commendable. Um, and I, you know, I'm fascinated. So I think years, as years go by, we'll reassess and, and wonder because the truth is, once we started going video, for a significant portion of the church, it's still very comfy. You know, um, when I grew up, we called it bedside Baptist. You know, it's like... Uh, just stay at home, except they didn't even watch it on TV. You know, they just stayed home by their pillow. But I would say, you know, particularly for those watching online who may not come on Sunday morning, I, I would just encourage, make your, get your feet back in. Put one toe in maybe, two toes, but stretch, you know, and grow. And if you're concerned about illness or disease, be safe. You know, it's nothing wrong with coming Best and nothing wrong with sitting in a corner somewhere. That's fine. But I think it is good to have fellowship. And uh, if there's somebody in the church who's a real hugger, maybe you might just say, you know, I love you. We're not hugging today. You know, <laughs> that's okay too. Um, you know, the Bible does say greet one another with a holy kiss, but I think we can put the asterisk and say hearty handshake, polite wave, Hi, you know, I think there is grace in the kingdom for that kind of thing. Moving on. Number seven, King Joash is sometimes compared to what other king? David, Saul, Solomon, Ahab. And the answer is Solomon. He starts well, does not end well. Um, and that is... Uh, his primary thing. He also was a stable king in the kingdom, but um, he, in the end, does not prove the most successful king. Number eight, the sin of Jeroboam is, now this is important, I'm hoping that after this class, you will know this. And Dr. Kaminsky mentioned this too. She didn't really develop it too much, but she did make reference to it. It shows up, Dr. Kaminsky said, repeatedly, the sin of Jeroboam, the sin of Jeroboam, sin of Jeroboam. By the way, there are two Jeroboam, so this is the sin of Jeroboam, a son of Nebat, I think is uh, the last name, or the family name. But it is this, worshiping a golden calf in Dan to the north, Bethel to the south. Dan to the north, Bethel to the south, south golden calf primary word reason so they didn't go to jerusalem to worship at the big temple yes and also i think it was your study last week when you mentioned that he in his mind it was almost equivalent to worship worshiping god it wasn't so much that it was a pagan god in his mind he was substituting yes you're absolutely right so the, the point being made is he wasn't thinking this is a an image of baal or asherah or molech but this is something that the people of Israel did in the wilderness. They worshiped a golden calf. And so it's, it's kind of connected to uh, the worship of Yahweh. Therefore, let's keep those people from, from going there. You know, it, it's kind of like any governor who says, I don't want people going to Las Vegas and spending their money there. And Las Vegas gets all the tax money. Let's have casinos right here. So they pass laws that have uh, Indian tribes have casinos and the money stays in New York State. You know, so that is kind of 
the same principle. You're trying to keep people local. You know, you don't have to go there. And that's like Mohegan Sun. All their ads are, you're so local, so close. Come here and lose your money. Don't go there and, and lose your money. Parenthetical thought. Can a Christian gamble? Can a Christian gamble and be a good Christian? Hmm. I, I would say when we think of those kinds of things, you always, yeah, you look at Romans chapter 13, I believe, in which the, he says, for some, you need to follow all the holidays. And for others, you don't. And he says, but each person should be settled in their own heart. In other words, if you can't work on a Sunday because you want to honor the Sabbath, Paul would say, amen, hallelujah, honor that. But for another person who says, you know, I feel I, I do honor the Sabbath. I, I rest, but I did mow my lawn. I enjoy it. You know, it's not, it's not work for me. But I think Paul would say, that's fine. It's not sin for you. But in the subject of gambling, I think it's similar. The Christians I know who gamble, this is what they do. They do it rarely, and they make a budget. I am going to lose no more than... $100, $500, and I am not, I'm making a covenant not to go to a cash machine, you know, and take out more money. And I know several people who do that, and I am not one of them. I would not say I would recommend that as a pastor, but I think that that could be under the realm of if they're acting wisely and maturely, I'm not going to hang them on it either. It's, it's kind of like drinking, you know, in that sense. Do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, according to Paul in Ephesians 5, verse 18, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I don't want to, in my case, I don't drink at all. But in my wife's case, she has over the year, maybe six margaritas when we go to a Mexican restaurant. I don't view her as a lush. <laughs> you know, I think she's acting reasonably and responsibly. But I think you guys all know, if you cannot finish your day without a little too much, you know, of a drink, I'm not saying a glass of wine at dinner, you know, that, that could be a very common thing, but you just, it's just acting wisely. And so that is what um, our goal is. This is not that though, the golden calf. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. What our what our brother Wilson is saying, it's not just about the fact that I may have freedom to gamble or drink, but there are people who watch what I'm doing and may feel released to do it without the boundaries of wisdom. And I think that's another caution with a pastor because, because I'm in a public figure that way. And by the way, I think it applies to so much. If I'm on Facebook giving these really nasty, slanderous, let's say political comments, I'm like telling the whole congregation, go for it, say everything nasty and you know, mean that you can on the internet. And that's a bad example. If you see me, you know, getting wasted, you know, somewhere. Pastor Henry, um, I, I would say, many would say to his credit, has raised the bar for the staff on this kind of thing. Um, and what I mean by that is I got a phone call saying, Pastor Steve, can you take me to Casket Empty? And it was a woman. And I'm going by myself to Casket Empty. Well, we have a rule for the staff that I cannot travel in a car with a woman other than my wife unless it's another woman also, you know, or another person also, and that I have to exercise that discipline. And it's not because, you know, I'm about to have an affair because I'm, you know, in the car with a woman, but it's the visual images. Was that Pastor Steve? That didn't look like Michelle. 
you know, well, you're just driving by. And suddenly this person has a question mark wondering where was he going? What was he doing? What was happening? And so you might say it's a high standard, but there's wisdom attached to the standard. Yes. Yeah. She was in AA because she was a severe alcoholic and drinking. Right, right. So now drinking is way out and AA meetings and all. Now Marianne has occasional drinks of faith. Uh, she keeps an eye out. If, if, if her mother's around, she would never, ever do it in front of her mother. Right. The, the comment is being watchful of people around you who may have issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me just tell the folks online. So the First Thessalonians 5.22 says avoid even the appearance of evil. Very true, but the issue is what is the definition of evil? In other words, you're, in other words, you're going to have that judgment there as to what is evil. Because um, on that, you can, you know, wrestle with somebody and, and this is by the way what has caused people to need detoxing from highly fundamentalist environments you know like my mother grew up that women should not have any jewelry so her ears were not pierced um, you shouldn't wear anything around your neck uh, god forbid you smoke or you know drink or go to movies or hang out with people who do those things you know, all of that was viewed as evil. And then she realized this is really an over-the-top definition. And at age 62, she got her ears pierced. She's like, this is not evil. You know, I, but that's where we have somebody can use that phrase and fill it with whatever they want. You have a TV in your house? <gasps> How could you do that? because they define TV as evil. Now, does the TV have lots of evil on it? It does, but it's not purely having a TV. TV is like having a chair, but I can do evil on this chair as much as I can you know, have evil with my, my television set. That's why I really like what the Apostle Paul says, each one must do what is uh, wise in their own eyes. But then he adds, watch out for the younger, weaker brother. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the comment was riding my scooter as an example. There are people who should never get near a scooter. <laughs> and, you know, uh, be wise. <laughs> All I can say. But there are people who shouldn't get behind the wheel of a car either. <laughs> All right, number nine. King Joash's primary goal was to A, bring the people back to the Lord, B, repair the temple. C, win over Aram. D, find a wife. And the answer here, I hope it was easy from the text, it's repair the temple. He, I mean, that was a real strong objective of his, and a, and a good objective, to repair the house of the Lord. And he attempted it, they raised the money, but then they got no traction because the, the priests were sitting on the money. But then he said, hey, what's going on here? And then they hired craftsmen. And the text went out of its way to say honorable craftsmen who could be trusted with the resources that they were given. And then it sounded like they got some traction. Last one. Who, was pretty, who has pretty amazing bones? Pretty amazing bones. A, Elijah. B, Elisha. C, Jezebel. D, Athalia. And it is Elisha. Why are they amazing? Well, you don't want to throw your dead family members on them if you want to keep them dead. <laughs> so if you have a particularly cranky somebody in your life, don't throw them on the bones of Elisha. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. 10 out of 10, anyone? Generous grading? 9 out of 10, generous grading? There we are. Thank you. I always want to see Fenny's hand. It, it just eases my soul that there was some information disseminated in class.
But the, the bottom line is, once again, if you didn't take this class, you wouldn't have two out of 10. These are hard questions. That, so you, know, you could go through casket empty, and maybe the only one you would get right is the sin of Jeroboam. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right, so now we are going into the passage. Now today, this is one of those passages. You know, I love teaching about Elijah, Elisha. They're, it's like an adventure. Who are they going to heal today? Who are they going to like, you know, send bears on? You know, which river are they going to dry up and walk on dry land? You know, all this kind of stuff, you know, call down fire from heaven. But now we are in just the crummy kings of Judah and Israel. I mean, there's semi okay kings here, but it's just, you know, they, you will not find yourself tonight full of vigor and vim, like, I want to be like Elisha. No one is going to say, really, I want to be like Amaziah. Uh, or, or, you know, we're going we're gonna to see some redeeming qualities, but not a whole lot. So let's look at the kings of Israel again. So here's the full list. I showed this to you last week. Too small to really look on the screen and uh, fully see it. Then I showed you an expanded one, which showed from David down to Uzziah. And tonight, we are going to go through that level. But I want to show you one more. This is showing the bottom half of the slide a little bigger. And if you go up, you can see Uzziah again and Amaziah. That's where we're beginning tonight, Amaziah. That's on the left side. But then on the right side, the whole reason you're seeing it shoot over is they're all killing each other. If you recall, the Lord promised Jehu, because he did all that judgment work, which feel, felt like more mafiosa judgment work, I'm going to kill this group, I'm going to kill that group, I'm going to kill this group, but he was doing the Lord's work. God promised him four generations and then when he got to the fifth, <laughs> you know, that was, that was it. And then it's like, kill, 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 kill. Um, and so we're wrapping up the northern part of Israel on this journey, you know, tonight. Um, but we're starting on Judah, Amaziah. Now, I want to give one strong um, asterisk today. And the asterisk is, if we were going to do a full-orbed study of these kings, we would have to be doing 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles adds a lot of interesting stuff to these kings, but we're not doing 2 Chronicles now. I will make some reference to a few of them, but I want to point that out. But I will say this also. Um, this Sunday, I'm going to be preaching at Island Christian Church in uh, Northport, East Northport. The pastor of that church is a former worship leader from this church. His name is Chris Coates, and he was the one who led the worship at the first service we did in Syosset. So he was there for the first two services, and then he left to join a church plant. But we've been friends over the years. And so now that he's a senior pastor of a very good church, I get to preach. And what I'm going to be preaching on, this is the topic he gave me, is how to study the Bible. And one of the principles is if you're not understanding somebody, look at the context. And if that's not, pull back even further. And so if you're stuck on something in 2 Kings, how you pull back even further is to look at Chronicles. And if that's not scratching the itch, Dare I say it, you got to start reading the prophets because the prophets are going to, like, for example, we're going to look at Uzziah, who in, in, in Acts is called Uzziah. So you have to, like, if you can see this map, see how it has under his name Uzziah, Azariah, excuse me, Azariah. It's the same person. But where do we see his name in the prophets? Isaiah 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple. So that is more information again about these kings. So 
good Bible study does necessitate, if you have the time, to pull back and see what you got. New Testament example is if you read something that Paul says that causes you to go, hmm, you know what you need to probably do is read then the whole book of what you're reading. And if that doesn't answer your question, read all of Paul's letters ah, <laughs> to figure out what Paul might mean by that. And then maybe reading the whole New Testament. And sometimes you've read the whole New Testament and you're still clueless. For example, at the end of 1 Corinthians, this is why we baptize for the dead. No one has a clue what Paul means by that. Now, commentators will tell you what they give a guess at it, and they'll give you like 27 reasons what Paul may be referring to. Like, I'm getting baptized in honor of grandma. But we don't know that's what it means. And so there's an example of you can read all of Paul's letters and still walk away and go, hmm, not quite understanding that. Um, but that does help you. I know I'm on a little rabbit trail here. But like women in ministry, what does Paul think about it? If the only thing you read was 1 Timothy chapter 2, I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. And then you saw that as the definitive work of Paul on that. You're missing something. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, women pray and prophesy in the church. Prophecy is the proclamation of God's word. He says, Junius is foremost among all the apostles. Well, that's fascinating. And it also says that Phoebe is a blessed deacon in the church. So I look at all these things and I'm like, okay, this is not the last word Paul has on women. And so by reading all of his letters, I gain a broader understanding of Paul's view. And then when I get back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, people always miss this. There's only one command in that whole chapter, or in that whole section. It is, let the women learn. That's the only command. It's the only imperative in the text. Everything else is him just describing. And so, fascinating to me, but here I'm, my little rabbit trail, which got a little longer, is context. We're not going to see the second Colosh, uh, Chronicles context. We'll dip into it a little bit, but, but not fully. So here we go. Uh, Amaziah, king of Judah, chapter 14. And uh, I read this. In the second year of Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel. So they're always paralleling. And again, you can see this on the screen behind me. Um. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. So it sounds like a pretty good reign here. It's actually that 29 years has a huge asterisk on it, but we'll see that a little later. When he became king, he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoadan. Now, remember, we don't get mother's names for kings of Israel. We get them for kings of Judah. Um, probably because it's the lineage of Messiah. She was from Jerusalem, so hometown girl. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father David had done. Now that should stop us in our tracks. He did what was right, but not like David. What is happening there? So this is an example. You're looking at a narrative passage in which that is not explained. But when you look, I'm going to pull back in the context, and you recall, whenever you see, but he did not remove the high places, you know, this little asterisk saying he didn't quite do that. Here's the difference. <clears throat> is David a sinner? Somebody say amen. David is a big time sinner. Is Amaz Amaziah a sinner? They say amen. Amaziah is a sinner. But you know what? David followed the Lord wholeheartedly. It wasn't just, you might say, a Sunday morning Christian goes to church a couple times a month, you know, a couple times a year, uh, a Christer, Christmas and Easter. But if you ask them, are they a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, there's a difference between somebody who follows wholeheartedly 
and somebody who follows with lukewarmness, if you will. And this may be your primary teaching point tonight, so don't miss it. To look at yourself in the mirror and say, can I see in myself wholeheartedness? Wholeheartedness. Gave you the illustration of picking up the guy to help him get gasoline. It's times like that that I am trying to wrestle with my own duplicitous heart. Am I willing to give money to somebody that I feel the Holy Spirit saying, yeah, give some money to this person? Or you hear a cause that you're the Holy Spirit is saying you should support. By the way, something amazing happened on Saturday. When Dr. Kaminsky said that um, we should support people in seminary, um, and then Pastor Henry got up and mentioned how somebody paid for my seminary. Somebody there went to one of our seminarians and said, I want to pay for your education. That very day. That very day. Now, interestingly enough, this particular seminarian is actually not poor. <laughs> you know, he's, he actually does pretty good. But my, my point, though, that's somebody trying to put their money where their mouth is. And that's a beautiful thing. So when you see that, you know, somebody needs a home and you have an empty room and you're thinking, should I, shouldn't I? Are they going to be like my house guests forever now? You know, all that kind of stuff. You wrestle with it. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and then be wholehearted, you know, is what it comes down to. And he wasn't. So, to fill that example, in everything he followed the example of his father, Joash, who was also half-hearted, the high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Church in their backyard, they still did that. Not a horrible crime, not God's ideal, as things are unfolding. After the kingdom was firmly established, he executed the officials who had murdered his father, the king. A little vengeance time there. No critique of the text on this. It seems like it was justice rendered. And we uh, move on. Yet he did not put the children of the assassins to death in accordance to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, where the law commanded Parents do not put the death uh, for the children, for their children, nor the children put the death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. Now that's from Deuteronomy 24, 16. Deuteronomy 24, 16. But what I love about this statement is the, the rule of Scripture is actually changing what he does. He's actually evaluating I can punish this person, but I don't punish the other people. And how many times do we know what the scripture says and just ignore that little part of it? I think I've shared this story in the past. A church once asked me, would you help us sue another church? And it was actually, I would call, in some respects, a very reasonable lawsuit. Very reasonable. But it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you're suing another Christian? You are going before secular people to ask them to decide things relating to the kingdom? And Paul says, by no means. And so I told my friend, who was a good friend, and he was really ticked at me, that we were not going to help. I told him well, I would do one thing. This is my conviction, but I will go before our elders and see if they want to overrule me on this, because they can. And I went before the elders, and I think to their credit, the elders said, Steve, we can't do that. The scripture's pretty clear. We cannot sue another brother. And so with that in mind, we didn't. But how many of us like ignore little things like do not be unequally yoked together? Well, I know the Bible says that, but he's such a nice guy. You know, and, and I think he went to Catholic Church when he was up to age five. You know, so I think he has a Christian in there somewhere. You know, it's just, all right, you know what? You can keep going down that path, 
but you're going to be like this king, uh, meaning when he doesn't get rid of the high places, you, you do some stuff good. And, you know, when they write your obituary on your tombstone, it could say, he generally followed the Lord. For the most part, she followed the Lord. Didn't quite go all the way, you know. Just keep those things in mind. I really love that verse. It's so rare in the book of Kings. They looked at the Bible and did what the Bible said. I wish we saw that more often in my own life. Quite honestly, I wish I, you know, did that more often. Number seven, verse seven. He was the one who defeated 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. So let's see if we can find the Valley of Salt. I have to go through. Okay, here we are. So see this picture. Look under the Dead Sea. That's the biggest body of water you see in this. And then you see the Valley of Salt. So what is near the Valley of Salt? Edom. Edom or Edomites. And he took on the Edomites. So what we read here. He was the one who defeated 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt and then captured Selah. See Selah on the map there? Okay, he's, he's got some stuff there. Calling it Jorkthiel, the name it has to this day. Then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, northern king of Israel, with the challenge, come, let us face each other in battle. So he is picking a fight with the northern kingdom. Now, there are moments when you can see stupidity. This is a moment where the good king of Israel, who did not follow the Lord to the example of David, here's an example where I think we could say, the text doesn't say it, but I think implied in the text is he did not inquire of the Lord. What might be a wise thing for this good king to do? Ask God, is it wise to fight our northern brethren? So, this is what happens when you get kind of overconfident in what you're doing. Um, I, I know I tell my stories a lot, but when we had our first Easter here, um, that I was pastor and we had 764 people, I was so proud because I knew of no church on Long Island except Smithtown Gospel Tabernacle and the upper room that came close to 764 people. And so I went to the Billy Graham Crusade preparatory meeting and I wanted to brag on the Monday after Easter how many people we had. And so I said to the person next to me, how many did you have at Easter? I could care less how many people he had at Easter. I just wanted to tell him I had 764. And the guy said to me, I didn't know he was from Smithtown Gospel Tabernacle. And they had this passion show. And he said, the Lord blessed. We had 12,000 through the door. That shut me down, you'd think. But I still had a person sitting on the other side of me. So I turned to him and I said, uh, what church are you from? This time I'm a little more cautious. And he said, oh, I'm from Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge, which I knew on an average Sunday has 5,000 people. So uh, the Holy Spirit said to me, Steve, are you finished? We can go on all day if you like, you know. And, but in this case, pride, he had a big victory. So he's patting himself on the back. So he thinks because he beat this little country of Edom that he's able to take on Israel, which at this point in history is a much stronger nation. And so this is what we read. But Jehoash, king of Israel, applied to Amaz replied to Amaziah, king of Judah, in a little poetic way. A thistle in Lebanon sent a message to a cedar in Lebanon. Give your daughter to my son in marriage. Then a wild beast in Lebanon came along and trampled the thistle underfoot. You have indeed defeated Edom. whoopee do! And now you are arrogant. Glory in your victory, but stay at home. Why ask for trouble? Cause your own downfall and that of Judah also. Well, pride comes before what? The fall. Verse 11, Amaziah, however, would not listen, so Joash, king of Israel, attacked. He and Amaziah, king of Israel, face each other at Bet Shemesh in Judah. 
So let's check out Beth Shemesh. Now, I want to point something out. I have two maps on the screen. Beth Shemesh is up high under the Sea of Galilee. That is in Israel territory. But we're reading that he fought in Beth Shemesh of Judah, a much smaller community. It's one of the Levitical cities. And the second map shows you Beth Shemesh. And the, and the reason that map is of poorer quality, let's say, it's because it was hard to find one that even had Beth Shemesh on the map, you know, to show you guys. But it's a different place. So instead of being up high, it is uh, lower. And that's where you have um, this battle taking place. And that is in Judah. And so we uh, move on. <coughs> Excuse me. Jehoash, king of Israel, verse 13, captured Amaziah, king of Judah. This is the only time in our Bibles we find a northern king capturing a southern king. And let's see what happens. Then Jehoash went to Jerusalem, broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate, a section of about 400 cubits long. Now, to this, I want to give you a picture again. Let's see. I have. There we are. Okay. So, this is an artist's depiction of Jerusalem roughly at that time. And Ephraim would be to the north. So, think of the top of the screen. And when it says to the corner gate, we're basically looking at from the top of the screen where you see the temple depicted, make a left turn and go 400 cubits. A cubit is from here to here, about 18 inches. You times that out, it's 600 feet. So tore down the wall 600 feet on that side, the uh, um, western side. Yeah, that would be, I think, the western side of Jerusalem. And so left Jerusalem vulnerable. In other words, this was humiliating. It, you know, this is your capital city. It's like the War of 1812 when the British burned Washington, burned the White House. The British lost the War of 1812. At least it was a stalemate. But the bottom line is it was very humiliating to have your capital burned down, the White House. And so the next statement is just so tragic. He took all the gold and silver... And all the articles found in the temple of the Lord in the treasuries of the royal palace, he also took hostages and returned to Samaria. So that's sad on multiple levels because this is a king of Israel robbing the temple. So pride of Amaziah is what sparks this. But then the evil of King Jehoash combined with it and you see one thing collapses into another until a very sad story takes place. As for the other events in the reign of King Jehoash and what he did in his achievements, according, including the war against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Annals of the Kings? Jehoash rested with his ancestors and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. And Jehor, uh, Jeroboam, this is Jeroboam II, his son succeeded him as king. Amaziah, verse 17, son of Joash, king of Judah, lived for 15 years after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel. Now, here's my asterisk that I told you about. He reigned for, what did I tell you, 29 years? But it was not a happy reign. I mean, we're talking the first part, he was a king. Second part, he's pretty much a captive or out of commission, you know, and, and something you know, good is not happening to him. So it, it's not a great reign of his. And um, there is probably an overlap with his son as king um, because of that. You know, he's king, Amaziah, but he's captive, you know, and, and, and in prison. He's like Nelson Mandela in South Africa. You know, he's, he's just out of commission. Um, verse 18, as for the other events in Amaziah's reign, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? If I can go back in time and say, you know what, we're not going to have those books 
could you give us a few more details? Apparently the Lord didn't want that. So I have to go with what the Lord wants. We don't know, you know, what those books contain. Verse 19, they conspired against him in Jerusalem. This is Amaziah now. And he fled to Lachish, but they sent men after him to Lachish and killed him there. So that's Amaziah. So let's take a look at Lachish. This is an aerial view of Tel Lachish. Now I can also show you what it looks like on a map, I think. Uh, I'm not seeing it on this map. I think I have it on another map. Let's see. Oh, I'm not finding it on the map, but I can show you. Um, there it is. Wonderful. I knew I had the map here somewhere. So you see Jerusalem? So he escapes from Jerusalem to Lachish. That is the city on the, you know, it's pretty readable there. And that picture I showed you is what Lachish looks like. Now, um, it's there to this day. Um, so this is going to fall very prominently in next week's lesson because this is a very, very important city. Um, actually, not next week. It might be a few weeks from now. But it is the fall of Lachish that ultimately um, Assyria uh, attacks Jerusalem, this major empire. But Lachish is a fortified city defending the Wadi Gravin. So this is me standing on the top of Lachish, taking a picture, and it's, it's, you can see it in the shadows, but if you look at the very top, that is the mountains of Israel, that shadowy area. The only way you bring a mechanized army into the mountains is through dry riverbeds, in this case, the Wadi Gravin. So you build a fortified city at the mouth of that Wadi to keep protection of your inner city, your inner nation, which in this case is Jerusalem. And so that's where he's escaping to because it's a fortified city. So he's like, oh, I'll find protection there. But they chase him and they kill him there. He was brought back by horse and was buried in Jerusalem with his ancestors in the city of David. I want to point out this phrase, with his ancestors, because as we look at his son, Isaiah, we're going to find, Azariah, excuse me, Azariah, or Uzziah, his son is not going to be buried with his ancestors, but near his ancestors. It's an important distinction, and you'll hear about that in a little while. So, sad story, followed the Lord half-heartedly, dealt with pride, dealt with stupidity, by the way, there are wonderful Christian people who are still stupid. You know, it just, it is what it is. Then verse 21, all the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. He was one who built Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. And I believe I have a map of Elath, too. It could be one of these things that I find Elath later. Yeah, we're going to leave it out for now. I'm not going to spend my time trying to find Elath. Oh, I, wait, wait, wait. I got it. I'm just being foolish. It's modern day Elat. There we go. So that's what confuses me in my mind. So on the bigger map is the Assyrian Empire at its extreme. It's not there yet. It's going to get there. But I want you to look at the Gulf of, of see the Red Sea on the bottom, on the big map? If you follow that tributary up north, that is where the little dot is that says Izan Giber. That is Elath, or modern day Elat. And you can see it on the other map too. 
but it's just showing the little tip of the water on the very bottom there. So, little side note, my wife has scuba dived right there. It's kind of cool. So when I went to Israel for the first time, we went to Elat, and um, there's three countries that merge in that one area. Uh, Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. They all share one little corner of this, and you can't get from one to the other. I mean, you can like throw a stone, but it's like walls, fences, you know, they're not polite little nations one to another. Um, but anyway, she did a wreck dive there, which was kind of cool, a ship that was sunk years ago, and she went scuba diving. Second time we went with Pastor Leslie came with us, and um, we, were, we were leading a conference with missionaries in Jordan. So the first time I was in the Israeli part by the Gulf of Aqaba, and the second time I was in the Jordanian part. And uh, it's, it's kind of cool to actually see it. But anyway, that's what he captured. Big excitement. At this time, what that means for you and I, it's access to a port, which means it increases your revenues, your ability to trade, to get things from the Orient, those kinds of things. So that's why it's kind of an important uh, victory. And restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. I can't say he rested very well because he was murdered. Okay, flipping over to Jeroboam the second king of Israel. Now, while I'm here, he is probably arguably the strongest king Israel ever had. Very effective. And he extended his rule. Um, so I have it here. Yes, here we are. He, I extended it to Lebo Hamath. Look at that, way to the north. Now, I want to show you how far north. Previously, the border was Dan. Now, the fact that it's going to Lebo Hamath, that is approaching Solomon's size of the kingdom. So he's very effective as a king. He's an evil king, but he is an effective ruler. There's another principle. You can be an evil person and still accomplish powerful things. Um, we, we see that. I mean, as Christians, case in point, most Christians are very happy about the potential of Roe v. Wade being overturned. Um, that being said, the instrument of having the Supreme Court having these conservative justices was a very crass man, <laughs> Donald Trump. You know, so sometimes you have these juxtapositions which are baffling in some respects, but, you know, happen that way um, is to, uh, you know, what's going on. So now we go to King Jeroboam, strong king. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, northern kingdom, Israel, same name. He reigned for 41 years. That is the longest ruling northern kingdom king. So that's a long time, 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. And you guys now are experts on what that sin is. Worship a golden calf, symbolizing perhaps Yahweh, but in Dan and in Bethel. That is the primary sin. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea. So you could see it, Lebo Hamath, and then you go down to the Dead Sea. Very effective as a, a military leader. Now, this is fascinating. In accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant, Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. Yes, this is the same Jonah. So let's see, here it is. Okay, so this is a map of where the prophets are hanging out. So you see up top Gath Hefer, and then you see Jonah. Is that's where he's from. And then you can see where Elisha, 
you know, hung out were Elijah, uh, Tishbi, uh, Ahijah. Look at all the prophets in Jerusalem. You know, just a whole slew of them there. And Jeremiah is kind of a prophet from Jerusalem too, but they're listing him as a little separate. But this gives you a flavor of where these prophets are hanging out. But this is one of those moments where, like remember I told you, you're trying to figure out Jonah as a book. And you read the book of Jonah, but is there more to know about Jonah? This is when you get yourself a good Bible concordance. And you see, does the name show up anywhere else? And so you see it here and you go, son of Amittai. And you're like, well, that's the same name it mentions in the other Jonah. And if it's not clear, remember I told you we had an Obadiah, but it's a different Obadiah. You know, you find that out, you have a good Bible dictionary and it will tell you all the Obadiahs, you know, that may be listed in scripture. But this is uh, a word of the prophet and it's just like saying it on the side. Um, this was in accordance to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel spoke through his servant, Jonah, son of Amittai, prophet in Gath Hefer. Okay, interesting. So Jonah gives a word to a bad king, and these kings, you know, um, sometimes honor the word of Yahweh, sometimes they don't. The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said... He, was, he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. He saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. Now, here's a simple point. He is making a theological case here. And the theological case is this. The Lord is giving you a strong king because you've been suffering. Remember that king from Aram has been meddling with them, invading? Well, that day, those days are over. Um, and so... This is attributed to the Lord's mercy. So God's giving mercy to allow a evil king to accomplish much because he just loves his people. He wants them to be protected and safe and be able to grow crops and not have them stolen. So, um, verse 28, as for the other events of Jeroboam's reign and uh, all that he did, and his military achievements, including how he recovered both Israel, both Damascus and Hamath, which have belonged to Judah, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jeroboam rested with his ancestors, the kings of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, succeeded him as king. Now, let me talk about the importance of this king. So, this is a seal that was found that says Shema, who we have no idea who Shema is, servant of Jeroboam. Now, why is this important? Number one, it gives archaeological evidence that there was indeed a Jeroboam, but it does even more than that. It shows, based on the quality of the seal, that this was a powerful king. You can notice things like that. You know how you can notice if somebody's doing okay by the kind of car they might drive? You know, like they pull up in their Tesla and like, he ain't suffering, you know, and, and someone else comes in their 1973, you know, whatever, and they go, do you need any help? You know, can I help you? The fact that this is a quality seal conveys the power of Jeroboam. You look for little clues like that, and, and we found one um, in this, so that is interesting. There is a textual issue in the passage I just read. The textual issue is, verse 28, he recovered for both, both Damascus and Hamath. There's no phrase there which says, which have belonged to Judah. It just says, Judah. And are they not written? It doesn't have what had belonged to Judah. The translators put that phrase in there. Most translations, they put a little asterisk there because it just says Judah of Israel, which is so confusing. What do they mean by that? But what it probably means is that at this time, Judah is kind of under the thumb of Israel. In other words, a very powerful Israel king. Judah is still a distinct people with their own king but probably paying tribute to the king up north. 
that's probably what's uh, going on there. But it's a textual issue. All right, chapter 15. Now we're going to go king after king, dead after dead. You know, but here we go. Um, well, not, not so much. Azariah lasts for a while. <laughs> he actually lasts for 52 years, so he, he's going to be. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. So he is a real long reign. Starts pretty young, 50, uh, 16 years old. His mother's name was, here we got the mother's name again, um, Je Jecolia. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now watch this next phrase. Just as his father Amaziah had done. Do you think that's a, a strong endorsement? No, it is not. He didn't have that many affairs you know, not like other people have lots of affairs. He only had a couple, you know. It was this, you know, asterisk. He was okay. He was okay. <laughs> I had a high school uh, teacher. He said, you know, there's certain presidents that people love or hate, like FDR. You loved him or you hated him. Ronald Reagan, you loved him or you hated him. Eisenhower, you like him. You know, all the buttons were, I like Ike. You know, Democrats liked him. Republicans liked him. He was a Republican, but he almost ran as a Democrat. He was just trying to decide, flip the coin, you know, I think I'll be a Republican. But this is what you have here, mediocre. So he has a story, which this is the one I want to tell from Chronicles. He was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifice and burn incense there. The Lord afflicted the king with leprosy until the day he died. Now, I stopped dead in my tracks when I read that. The Lord afflicted him? Now, if you're a good Calvinist, you're comfortable with that. Because everything is up to the Lord. There's nothing I do. You know, the joke with the Calvinist is you trip, you dust yourself off, and you say, well, I'm glad that's over with. Because it was planned from the foundations of the earth that on this particular day I was going to fall and trip and skin my knee. You know, and those from another tradition, Arminian, would say, come on, do you think God really cares whether you tripped on that day? Well, I think he cares. But, you know, was it planned from the foundations of the earth? Anyway, there's your debate for you. But this causes me to be interested. Was this him just saying, you know, anytime we get sick, the Lord gave that to you? Or is our sickness because we live in a broken, failed world and there's sickness in this world? Well, in this particular case, we do have some contributing things. So here's 2 Chronicles 26. Listen to the story. But after Uzziah, remember same name, became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. Have we heard that tonight before? He was unfaithful to the Lord as God and entered into the temple to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. So they're all trying to do an intervention with the king. You're not supposed to be in here. This is only for the priests. They confronted King Uzziah and said, it is not right for you Uzziah to burn incense to the Lord. Pause for one moment. The reason some speculate that it's Uzziah here and not Uzziah, Azariah. It's because it happens to be also the name of the priest. And the book of Kings doesn't tell the story. So there's no confusion with the name of the high priest and the name of the king. But if we were just using the name that the Kings has, what we would find is it's repeating the name, both people, it would be very confusing. So that is why the speculation is he's called Uzziah here and versus Azariah. The priest and the king happen to have the same name at this point. It is not right for you to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. Uzziah, 
who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry. And while he was raging at the priests in the presence before the incense altar of the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy in his forehead, so they hurried him out of the temple. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. So there you go. So in this particular case, it is not blaming all illness on the Lord, but it is mentioning specifically that this was an affliction because of his sin, because of his pride. And it's the thing of what pride can do to us. So back to Kings, you know, he had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house. Jotham, the king's son, had charge of the palace. So here we have a co-regency. So even though Uzziah is living a long, long time, he's not able to do the daily, you know, he's not meeting the dignitaries. Where's the king? He's in the shed and back. He has leprosy. Um, so his king is basically functioning as uh, the governor of the land. Verse 6, As for the other events of Azariah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Azariah rested with his ancestors, and here it is, and was buried near them in the city of David. And Jotham, his son, succeeded them as king. So not with them, near them. Now, here's another cool little archaeological find. Near Jerusalem, but not at Jerusalem, was found this plaque tomb of Uzziah. These are a cool and amazing finds. These finds are very recent in history. You know, so archaeology is, has buttressed Christianity so much in Judaism that these things happened in place and time. This is another example. Now, we're going to go through all these kings of uh, Israel that are going to come and go. Zechariah, king of Israel. In fact, I'm going to go back to the chart here so we can... Yeah, there we are. Yeah, that's good. Here we go. In the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, son of Jer Jeroboam, became king of Israel in Samaria. He reigned six months. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. No surprise there, northern kingdom, as did his pre predecessors had done. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Knowing what that is helps you read this book so much. If you just keep reading that, you keep going, what's the sin of Jeroboam? What's the sin of Jeroboam? But you guys know. You guys got it down. Which he had caused Israel to commit. Shalom, son of Jabesh, conspired against Zechariah. He attacked him in front of the people, assassinated him, and succeeded him as king. And so you look in the map here, behind it, you got Zechariah. Then it's not his son that reigns, but you just move over to another dynasty, a very short-lived dynasty, I might add. Um, and uh, as for the other events of Zechariah's reign, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? So the word of the Lord spoken to Jehu was fulfilled. Your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And there you go fulfillment of what the prophet said and then it comes to an end shulam king uh, son of jabesh became king in the 39th year of uzziah king of judah and he reigned in samaria one month Woo! another big long reign here then menahem son of gadi went from tirzah to up to samaria he attacked shulam son of jabesh in samaria assassinated him and succeeded him as king. We're not dealing with a very stable time in Israel's history. It's a total disaster. Um, verse 16, at that time, Menahem, starting out from Tirza, attacked uh, Tipshah and everyone in the city and its vicinity. Now, get ready for this next phrase. It is painful. Because they refused to open their gates, he sacked Tipshah and ripped open all the pregnant women. There are times when I read these things 
And I'm like, how is this, how is this even possible? I mean, what evil resides in the heart? You know where we find this kind of thing happening? The Assyrians, this evil people to the north, and now a king of Israel? And you wonder why God says Israel has to come to an end. It's done. It's finished when this kind of evil takes place. Verse 17. In the 30th, 39th year of Azariah, they keep flipping between Uzziah, Azariah, same guy, king of Judah, Menahem, son of Gadi, became king in Israel, and he reigned in Samaria 10 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord during his entire reign. He did not turn away from the, here we come again, sins of Jeroboam, Jeroboam son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Then Pul, king of Assyria, invaded the land, and Menahem gave him a thousand talents of silver. Now, Pul, king of Assyria, is a very famous person in world history. His name is Tiglath Pilzer III. Tiglath Pilzer III. Now, I meant to grab a picture of this guy. I don't think I did. I did not. But basically, we're talking now the king of Assyria. So all the green you see on this map, that is now the Assyrian Empire. Israel still exists as a nation, paying tribute because it's such a massive kingdom. Now, Assyria has one primary goal. They really want to trade safely with Egypt. Because Egypt's a big country. And so that is why they are now exercising authority over this particular area. But what I wanted to show you, and I think I can show you. I'm just going to enter this in there, because this is what I meant to give you. There it is, shows up immediately. Now I'm going to go images. Okay, see him all over the place? There he is. Very important person in history. I mean, extra biblical material, tons of material on this guy. But in our... Oh, ha! Here I am waxing eloquent on this beautiful picture here. Sorry. We'll, we'll, be, we'll have this together in just a moment. Let me add a new slide. Let me come here. Okay, now I will go back. We got it? There we are. Sorry. Um, it's, I generally don't look behind me. I forgot when I left my program, it's like shifting a, a screen over. But anyway, very famous guy. This is what he looks like. This is all over the place. And so uh, moving on. Uh, his, his name is Paul here. It's just an abbreviation is what it is. Verse 19. How many minutes do I have? Like three? <laughs> what, what time is it? Okay, we're going to move through this very quickly. Um, verse 20. Menahem exacted money from Israel. Basically, he's taxing everyone to pay off Assyria. And... As for the uh, uh, 50 shekels from every rich person, so the king of Assyria withdrew and stayed in the land no longer. Verse 21, As for the other events of Menahem's reign and all he did, are they not written in the annals of the kings of Israel? And Menahem rested with his ancestors and, uh, let's see, Pekahiah, Pekahiah, um, his son succeeded him as king. Now let me go back to the chart of the kings. There we are. In the 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, also known as Uzziah, Pekahiah, son of Menahim, became king of Israel in Samaria. He reigned two years. Pekahiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which had caused Israel to commit. One of his chief officers, Pekah, son of Ramaliah, conspired against him, taking 50 men with Gilead, and he assassinated him. Here we go again along with 
Argob and Ira in the citadel of the royal palace of Samaria. So Pekah killed Pekahiah and succeeded him as king. As for the other events, are they not written in the annals of the king? Now, last quick bit here. In the 50th, in this 52nd year of Azariah, so this is at the end of his reign, Pekah, son of Ramalia, became king in Israel and Samaria. He reigned 20 years. He is basically a puppet king. This is a very weak king. Uh, you know, Assyria is really holding sway. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he caused Israel to commit. In the time Pekah was king in Israel, Tiglath-Pilzer, king of Assyria, that's the name you heard pull before, came and took Ejon, Abel, Beth, Makkah, Janoa, Kedesh, and Hazor, Hazor. And that was the last map I showed you here. So that is the incursion of what is coming down. He took Gilead, Galilee, including the land of Naphtali, and deported people to Assyria. So Israel is slowly disappearing. It's still there, but it's disappearing. Then Hoshea, son of Elah, conspired against Pekah, son of Ramaliah. He attacked and assassinated him and succeeded him as king in the 20th year of Jotham, son of Uzziah, as for the other events, so on and so forth. Verse 32, in the second year of Pekah, son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. His mother's name was uh, Jerusha, daughter of Zodak. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Uzziah had done. If he's really good, it says, just as his father David has done. So we got another mediocre king here. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifice. Jotham rebuilt the upper gate of the temple of the Lord. That was what was destroyed by Israel. So he rebuilds that section. And as for the other events of uh, Jotham's reign, what he did, are they not written in the annals of the kings? In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, against Judah. Jotham rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David, the city of his father. And Ahaz, his son, succeeded him as king. Last thing to point out is this is now, Judah is a very weak kingdom. So weak Israel and weak Aram, because they're now under the sway of Assyria, are pushing into Judah, which is very weak. And so that's their situation. And that's where we end. We're going to come next week to the end of Israel, the northern kingdom. 722 BC, it comes to an end. Where we are right now is approximately 7. 30 BC. They got about a, uh, eight years to go. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the chance we've had to go over these passages. And what a mess humanity can be. What a mess we can be. Father, the one thought I take away this evening is I don't want to be like my father Uzziah. I want to be like my father David, who followed you wholeheartedly. He's not a man with it all together. But one thing David did, when he sinned, he repented, and he desired to honor you with his whole being, dancing before you with all his might. Father, may we be people like our father David. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you all.